glad you're here tonight. I'm dressed as I might have been when I was digging at the dig site at Umeri in Jordan in the year 2002. Every day I got the privilege of getting up at 4.30 so we could be at the dig site by 5.30. 4.30 is my best time of day. My wife will tell you that. And we were out the dig site every day and this is the way I dressed. Usually with a white shirt, just like I were going to church. Now actually it was in order to um, have the sun reflect off. It was actually cooler to dress like this. And uh, I wore my hat to protect my ears so I didn't um, burn too badly. And so I I had a lot of fun. And tonight I'm going to show you some pictures of some of the things that I did when I was at the Tel Umeri in Jordan. So in order to get ready, I'm going to get rid of this. And I'm going to get rid of this. Oh, it fell off. I was hoping it would stay. Okay, well, let's get started. We're going to let me tell you about the tale of the trowel. Tells do tell tales. First off, you say, what is a tell? A tell in Arabic is T-E-L-L, or in Hebrew, it's T-E-L. Basically, what it is, it's a large artificially created mound or hill. This is actually Tel El Umeri, where I was digging. They can be very, very large ancient cities built one up on top of one another. Here at Umeri, you can see this picture of the different layers as we were digging through the ancient cities on Tel Umeri. It is an artificially constructed ancient city that is that uh, they're scattered all over Palestine, just hundreds of these ancient city mounds all over Palestine. This is how they came to be. The ancient people came to a spot and decided this looks like a good place to build a city. And so what did they do? They cleared it out and built a nice settlement. It was probably there because they probably settled there because there was good water supply. Uh, perhaps there was an area for uh, being able to, um, to graze sheep and goats. Uh, perhaps it was a defensible position. Perhaps there was lots of, of uh, good resources there for building. And so they built a city because of its location. They lived there for 500 years. And then... A superbug visits, and everyone in the city dies because of being, b- being sick with this plague. And so the city goes into ruins. All the people die. The city goes into ruins. The sands blow in. The rain falls, and erosion happens, and, this, and dirt rolls in. And so the city goes into ruins. 500 years later, someone else comes to the same spot and decides that this looks like a good place to build a city because it's a good location of defensible position. It has a spring. All these same reasons that brought the first people to build the city, this next group of people come and they build another city. They live there for a while until some roving band of warriors comes through and kills them all, and steals everything that they had. And so the city falls into ruins again. 100 years later, 300 years later, it doesn't matter how long, a 1,000 years later, someone comes to the same place, and because of the things we've already talked about, they decide this would be a good location to build a city. And so they build another city. And this happens over and over and over again. Some of the ancient tales have 20 ancient cities built one upon top of the other. And as the rubble increases, the hill, the tell, the mound increases. Now, I have a friend whose name is Dave Merling. I always give Dave Merling all the credit for this because I don't want to get in trouble. But Dave Merling says that the fact that tells exist shows that in the ancient world, men ran the world. 
You say, how does that prove that? It's because of this. If the women had run the world, they would be like my wife. When it came to the new spot to build a new city, they would say, okay, all this junk, clean it all out. I want it nice and fresh. That's what your wife would do, right? So they would, they would clean it all out, and then uh, we would start all over again. So if women were running the world back in the biblical time, then there would be no such thing as an ancient tell. I don't know if Dave's right or not, but it sounds good to me. Now, what is the major implication of this kind of tell construction for an archaeologist who's digging down into the tell? There's a major implication about this construction. That is that the digger, the, the deeper the archaeologist digs, what? The older in time. So when an archaeologist digs through an ancient tell, he is literally digging from early, from, from earlier times or from recent times until, until times further in the past, digging through time. You can see this picture of uh, how the stratification is. This is actually a reconstructed uh, tell at the University of Pennsylvania Museum where I took this picture. But it's, it, some of the layers can be very distinctively uh, very distinctively designed so that you can tell a great difference between each of the layers. In this picture, you can see the different layers that uh, in the wall of the, of the archaeological excavation, you can see these layers. These layers are red and studied so that we have an occupation record of who lived and how long they lived on this site. Now, archaeologists dig into these ancient tells to find, most people think, artifacts. But in actual fact, archaeologists are digging into these ancient tells to find clues. And every artifact is a clue. And the purpose of archaeology is to try to discover how people lived in the ancient world. Try to understand what their culture was like. Now, it is not a true science because in a true science, not yet, <laughs> in a true science, you can reproduce the, the experiment. How many of you have made dozens of of soda and vinegar volcanoes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Science project for kids, you make a, you put the soda, baking soda in the vinegar and every time you do that, but archeology span is not a true science because once an archeologist digs the material up, once the soil is disturbed, it can no longer ever be dug again. And so it's not a true science because it cannot be reproduced. And so that's why archaeologists have to be so very, very careful and exacting in what they're doing. Now, let me tell you, <clears throat> just forget everything you've ever learned from Indiana Jones. <laughs> it's not a true picture of archaeology. Forget Laura Croft and Tomb Raider. I guarantee you I've never seen a woman that looks like this on an archaeological dig. Forget Sidney Fox and Relic Hunter, these super duper archaeologists on TV. I hate to tell you a secret, but they're not really archaeologists. And most of what they find is not really quite true. In actual fact, there are very few f great and wonderful finds, and mostly archaeology is hard work, Mostly it is dirty fingernails. It is sweat. In uh, Jordan, where I was digging, usually the temperatures would get up to at least 100 degrees almost every single day. I was there for six weeks and did not see one drop of rain, nor one cloud in the sky that might bring rain. It's a very exacting, hard work. And I actually, um, I don't want to brag about this, but while I was there, 
I actually was a candidate for the Dirtiest Face Award one day. <laughs> so it's, a, it's hard work. But who knows what you may uncover next. My friend Randy Yonkers was, um, that's, a, that's a, I should say Randy Yonker because he's a one, not the one that you guys know around here. Randy Yonker is a friend of mine. He's actually in this picture. He leads the excavation at Tel Julul in Jordan. And Randy is a very good archaeologist and has taught me that, that excavation must continue to be very, very careful. Now this is uh, actually a the uh, dig site at Umiri. And um, this is the team that was at the the Umiri dig site in 2002. It's hard for me to, it's hard for you to find me per chance because I had my hair shorter than I've had it since I was eight years old. But that is me in the red shirt. People, well, that's also me almost 10 years ago. We won't go into that. This is my square. This is where I spent the summer of 2002, Field L. This time period that we were digging in here was about 300 BC, which is the Hellenistic period, which is the time of Alexander the Great. And it went back to about the year 1000 BC, which is the time of King David. And so we were digging back into time in this square. Now, depending on what you're doing, archaeologists will use varying techniques for, for digging. Sometimes they'll use a, a pickaxe and a shovel, but sometimes they'll use a dental pick and a brush or a trowel and a toothbrush, as I like to put it. It all depends on how exacting the work is. It's fascinating that today they're actually doing archaeology without even turning a spade of dirt because they're developing something called ground-penetrating radar. And the ground-penetrating radar can give a profile of what's under the ground so they can know if there are buildings and where the walls are and stuff by running this ground-penetrating radar over the ground. Well, people always want to find, want to ask the question of what do you find on an archaeological dig? And here's the word that most people know, artifact. The definition of an artifact is simply this. It's an object made or modified by a human being, by a man or a woman, period. Usually when you think of artifacts, you think of ancient artifacts. In actual fact, this little clicker that I use to advance my slides is an artifact. The pews in which you're sitting are artifacts as are all of the pieces of ancient pottery out front in the museum. It's simply an object that was made or modified. In the case of stone tools, we didn't make the stone, but humans have modified them. And so an artifact is made or modified by a human being. So what do archaeologists find? Well, one of the things that archaeologists find a lot of is pottery. Now, when I was at Umeri, we found this partial plate. It dates back to the time of Daniel, which is really cool, it, to the Persian period. My friend Tony and I found this in our square, and you can see this. It was hidden between two walls, and you can see it right there. See the little round spot? That's the plate that you just saw. Pottery is probably the most common artifact found on ancient sites in the Middle East. And it's also probably the most indestructible, uh, most indestructible artifact ever made by man. Ancient archaeological sites are scattered with pottery sherds everywhere. Now, what is a pottery sherd? A pottery sherd is simply a broken piece of pottery. And so any broken piece of pottery is a pottery sherd. I have a goal that every archaeological site I visit, whenever I go any place around the world, my goal is to find the pottery sherd to bring it home. I have thousands of pottery sherds at home. Yes, my wife is a very patient woman. She lets me have it in my own room. 
downstairs she's given me for archaeology. Usually pottery is broken and it litters all, all ancient sites. They also find, archaeologists also find, human remains or burials. And much can be discovered from burials because they can discover how people died. They can discover people's health. They can discover how old they were when they died. They can discover even things like what people were eating based upon their skeletal remains. And so archaeological, human remains and archaeological excavations are very important. Here's a couple that I found at, uh, at a dig site named Baba Draw, which is an archaeological site down east of the Dead Sea. I'll tell you a lot about this uh, another night. Uh, this is, I, I nicknamed this, this, uh, these two Bob and Edna. And I jumped down into a long, into this pit and shinnied back into this tomb and brought Bob and Edna out for a little portrait. And then I put them back in their tomb. Uh, the last thing I told my friend as I was shinnying back into this tomb was... Uh, Tell my wife I love her if I don't make it back out. Also, archaeologists find lots of architectural remains. The remains of ancient buildings. This is, again, my square at Umeri. <clears throat> and you can see the wall of the ancient room. Here's the wall, and this is the room itself. And you can see this wall extends back into this next square. And so architectural remains are very important. Archaeologists also find inscriptions like this huge inscription that uh, my friends at Andrews University found out in Jordan. It's the biggest inscription of this kind ever found in the Middle East. It's a thousand characters in a cave in, in uh, Jordan. But archaeologists also find tiny little inscriptions like this little sherd, broken piece of pottery that has this scratch on it. You see the scratch? And believe it or not, we believe this is the letter phi in Greek. It's a letter that's shaped like a circle with a, with a line down the middle of it. And so this was an inscription, even though it wasn't much of an inscription and we couldn't really tell too much about it. All the pieces of pottery, all the objects that are found, all the artifacts that are of any value are notated where they're found. And it's written on the pottery itself so we know what square it was in and all kinds of information, whether it's just the pottery shirt or whether it's actually a, uh, almost a whole piece of pottery like this little piece. In fact, let me just tell you the truth. What archaeologists find is trash. It's basically the leftovers of the ancient culture, most of which they had thrown away, especially the pottery shirts. And so mostly what archaeologists are finding is ancient trash. Another thing that archaeologists do as they're doing all of their work is they love to take pictures. You've seen those pictures of my square Aerial pictures showing the square as it, as it was going down. Well, this is how those pictures were taken. On a long ladder, every day, every day, they would bring this ladder by every square where we were digging at the end of the day and take a picture like this. I did not volunteer for this job. I, I would not like this job. I'm very glad it's not my job. Archaeologists, uh, as, they, um, as they are digging, take complete records. They draw pictures of what they find. I was always sure that I was partnered up with someone in my square that could draw because I can't. And so I would always let someone else draw the pictures. And then conclusions are drawn. And the most, one of the most important things that archaeologists can do is then publish their findings. Because if an archaeologist does not publish his findings, then that which he dug is lost. That information is lost forever. Because remember I told you, it can't be reproduced. And so I have to tell you the group that uh, I was digging with, the Madaba Plains Project at the Telumiri, they have a very wonderful record 
of publishing their, their excavations. And usually it's published by Andrews University Press. And so I'm very proud of them as, um, as archaeologists. Well, let me tell you, since people always want to know what I found in my square, this is my square, you can see it when it's not very deep yet. Let me show you some pictures of what I found in my square. I found this Egyptian Ptolemaic coin. Now, it's very corroded right now. You can barely see it, but can you see a face on it? This is probably, probably the god Zeus, most likely. I also found this wonderful little seal, probably dating to the Iron Age. It's very difficult to see what it is, but if you look at the seal, you can see some wings. There's some winged creatures. Here are the wings. Here's the heads, either side. So there are two winged creatures facing one another, and above is a winged god. At least that's what I say it is. Sometimes it's a little hard to tell. We also found this very interesting bronze weight, which dated to the Hellenistic period, which is the time of Alexander the Great. We found this little pendant made out of pottery. I don't know why, it, what it would have been used for, perhaps on a string around a neck. I don't know. I like to use my imagination and think that maybe this was a toe tag for uh, someone who had died. I don't know. Archaeologists have to use their, 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 their imagination. I found dozens of these grinding stones because uh, that's how they ground the grain in my square. In addition to this grinding pestle, which would have been used in like a, like a stone bowl. And then this was probably, the even though it's the most unsightly of probably most of the stuff I found, this was the rarest. This is an iron sickle blade that is 3,000 years old. And it dates to the Iron Age, and uh, it's obviously very, very rusted, but usually, usually iron doesn't make it at all. And then here is this, and what did they use that for? It's a stone bowl with a hole in the bottom, just to give you a... Uh, just to give you a, a scale, I took a picture holding it. And I've imagined that this was an ancient toilet bowl. Do you like it? <laughs> I found it. I can name it, right? And then this is another object I found. Uh, you can see how deep I am in my square at this point in time. Another object I found... It's um, very fascinating. I said it was a nacho and salsa dish, <laughs> but my square supervisor said it was a dog dish with food and water spot. So I don't know what it was, but a very fascinating thing to find as you're digging through the soil, to find these things in these ancient occupation levels. What did I find? I found 4,302 pottery sherds, which I took back, washed, and which we read, which means we tried to discover how old they were. I found 533 diagnostic sherds, which we kept for future study, which means those 4,000 or those 3,800 that we didn't keep, I had brought back, washed, and we took them back and dumped them. All that work to take them back and dumped them. I moved or sifted 2,269 gufas, and a gufa is like this this um, bucket up here that's made out, of an, made, made out of a tire. We sifted and moved 2,269 gufas, which is 21 cubic meters of dirt. I moved another three or more cubic meters of large stones, which the Arabs call hajars. And if you wanted to figure out what I moved out of my square in six weeks at Tel Umiri, I moved enough dirt and rocks to fill three dump trucks. The eight-ton dump trucks that you see bring gravel to your driveways, I would have filled three of those. That's a lot of work. Three dump trucks full. Well, I want to uh, transition just a second and, and talk to you about why I like archaeology. One of the reasons I like archaeology the best. One of them is because archaeology 
studies the ancient world. And the Bible was produced by the ancient world. And so when I was in a seminary, I discovered that by understanding archaeology, it helped me understand my Bible better. And so that's one of the things that drew me to archaeology. David says this. He says, your word in Psalm 119, 105. He says, your word is like a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's very true. But I found that the reverse is also true. That archaeology can shed light on the Bible. And so that's one of the reasons I love it. It can help us understand the Bible better. Now, that's going to be what I want to come back to in just a second. But before that, I want to share with you one other introductory thought. People always ask me, how do you know how old something is? My wife, when I get a new, well, when I get a new to me piece of pottery, one of the first things she does if I show it to her, and half the time I don't even show it to her anymore, One of the first things she does is pick it up and turn it around in her hands and look on the bottom. Do you know what she's looking for? Made in Japan or China or Taiwan. It doesn't matter where. El Salvador, you know. Doesn't matter where. She loves to tease me. And so the question is, how do you know how old something is? And so I want to tell you about two, two ways we know how old something is. One is called pottery style dating, and the other is called carbon-14 dating, and I'll tell you about it on Sunday night. First off, pottery style dating. Pottery style dating was discovered by a guy named Sir William Flinders Petrie. He was digging on a Palestinian tell at, called Tel El Hesse, and he discovered that certain kinds, certain styles of pottery were always up high And certain other styles were always buried down deep. And so he developed this principle that pottery styles change over a period of time. And that's what pottery style dating is all about. Now that still happens today. Let me show you a couple modern artifacts. Any of you who were mothers in the 60s? These were your best friend. What do we call it? Melmac. Why did mothers love Melmac? Because they don't break. That's why mothers love Melmac. But we found out that Melmac had some problems. It kind of scratched. And it also stained pretty badly. And so Melmac had some problems. And so in the 80s, Corning came out with Another mother's best friend, Corel. Now, Corel will break, but it is break resistant. I once upon a time, about 15 years ago, was having this lecture, and I said, Corel is unbreakable. And I held it out and dropped it. (laughs) And it shattered into a million pieces. (laughs) Well, I learned Corel is not unbreakable, but it is break resistant. It doesn't stain as badly. It doesn't, it doesn't um, scratch as badly, although it will scratch. And so you see pottery styles change over a period of time. Even in modern times, some of you will recognize this beautiful green glass. It came from a very distinctive period of time. What do we call it? Depression glass. It came from the 30s. This happens to be one of my grandmother's pieces. It's very, very precious to me. It's a juicer from the 30s, a piece of depression glass. So you see that even today, pottery styles still change. Now to illustrate that, I want to show you some pictures of ancient pottery and ask you to try to help me figure out how old they are. We have this pottery chart on the right-hand side and... We have the piece of pottery on the left-hand side. This piece of pottery is in one of the cabinets out front. Do you see anything that looks like it? Early bronze. Do you see it um, right there? Is it exactly like it? No, it's not because this one 
does not have handles. However, this one that's on this this one that's on the stage is a perfect example of that piece of pottery from the early bronze. See, it has the ledge handles on it. Oh, you did pretty good. How about this one? It may be helpful to have the side view. You see it on there? I'll give you a hint. It's on the very far right-hand side. Do you see it on there? It is also early bronze. You see it right there. Okay? How about this one? This is called a juglet. Can you see one on here? The juglets are kind of the second area right in here. Do you see one that looks like it? Middle bronze? Right there. Is that it? No, how come? The base is a little too pointy. Iron Age, how about that one? It is, it is Iron Age. Pretty good. How about this one? This is another oil lamp. Now from this angle, it's difficult to see what it is. So you have to have the side view. It is the Persian period. You see, in the Iron Age, they're cupped. But in the Persian period, it's very, very flat right there. This is from the time of Daniel in the Bible, Persian period. I love this oil lamp. It's out in my collection out there in the lamps. You've done pretty good, but you see, you don't even have to have the whole piece to figure it out. That's how you read pottery. Here's a pottery shirt that I found and picked up on Tel Dor and brought it back from Israel with me a few years ago. When I, when I go, I always take as little as possible because I know I'm bringing a ton of stuff back. So can you tell where this one's from? You see anything that has a handle like this? It is Persian period. It is right there. Very, very good. And so that's how you know how old something is because of these pottery charts. And so when I put on, when I label the objects out here and I say this is Iron Age, this is early bronze, middle bronze, I've been doing my homework with these things. Okay. Well, let me launch into talking with you about the Bible about why, how archaeology helps us understand the Bible better. I love to study archaeology and the Bible together. And I accept the Bible as authentic and authoritative, as reliable and realistic, and as trustworthy and timely. Most of you don't understand how the Bible is under attack by critical scholars. Most, most people don't understand that uh, the critical scholars say that the Bible is not worth studying as far as history. Critical scholars claim that all the Bible books were written late, about 300 BC. Moses wrote the Bible, ha, couldn't have happened. Most critical scholars believe that the figures in the Bible did not actually exist. They do not believe that the events of the Bible actually happened. And something that we take, that I take as, as probably pretty pivotal in biblical history, the Exodus, most archaeologists and critical scholars say the Exodus didn't really happen. It's just propaganda the Jews made, made up so they'd feel good about themselves. And so most people don't understand critical scholarship of the Bible. Most critical scholars and most scholars in our leading universities and seminaries today are teaching the Bible like other teachers teach the Canterbury Tales or the, the plays of Shakespeare. The Bible is literature. And so they teach it like literature. It's fascinating to me that's, that um, some of the most important and influential Bible teachers of our time from places like divinity schools like Harvard and like North Carolina 
The teachers, some of the most important teachers of those schools are actually atheists and agnostics. They teach the Bible, but they don't believe it's power. They don't believe it has anything other than historical, not historical, other than literary information to impart to us. And so how can we know that the Bible is reliable and authentic? And so I want to give you, well, before, before that, I want to quote for you this text. We shouldn't be surprised because in 2 Peter 3, 3 and 4, Peter says this, first of all, you must understand that in the last day, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Peter foretold that in the days after, the, after his days, in the days of the last days of the world's history, scoffers would come and say, the Bible, ha, it's not of value. And that's exactly what's happening today. So the question that I want to pose for you from here out is, how has archaeology confirmed the Bible and helped us understand it better? The first way I want to tell you about is this. Archaeology has shown that the biblical narratives are accurate reflections of the times in which they are said to have occurred, which is an affirmation that they were written in that ancient time period. What do I mean by that? If you wanted to write a book on what it's like to live in Hagerstown in the year 2011, could you do it? It might not be a bestseller because you not, might not be a good writer, but could you write and reflect accurately what it's like to live in Hagerstown? Yes, you could. Could you write a book and reflect accurately what it was like to live in the 1940s? I couldn't. Some of you could because you're old. But I couldn't. Could you write a book about what it was like to live in the 1850s and 1860s around here and the Civil War period? Could you write a book? Not without research because you could not write a, a story that accurate, ref, accurately reflects the customs of the day. And so archaeology has shown us that the stories, especially in Genesis, really ring true to the time in which they said they're written. Here's an example. This is Genesis 15, 1 through 3. This is about Abram. It says, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, O solemn, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. What's the principle? Abraham doesn't have an heir, and so a servant will inherit from him. Now, archaeologists were digging at a place in northern Iraq named, uh, named Nuzi, and they found tablets, a group of tablets that date to 1500 BC. I like to date Abraham to about 1800 BC. So we're talking the same general time period. Things did not change as quickly in the ancient world as they do today. And so same general time period. And in the Nuzi texts, we find this, this uh, fascinating story in the Nuzi text about a top, this is a tablet of adoption. It says a tablet of adoption of a Hiltashep, the son of Pahia. Zigi, the son of Achiah, he adopted. If a Hiltashep has no son, see the principle here, if a Hiltashep has no son, then Zigi will be his principal heir. As long as the Hiltaship is alive, Zigi will serve him. With garments he shall provide him. The Hiltaship does not have a son, and so who will be his heir? His servant. The exact same thing we have in the Abraham story. So the Abraham story accurately reflects the customs of that ancient time in that ancient place. 
Here's another example. Uh, this is Genesis um, 16, 1 through 4. It says, uh, Now Sari, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maid servant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sari said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sari, his wife, took her Egyptian handservant, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar, and she conceived. This is a very fascinating ancient culture that's as modern as today. Today we call it surrogate motherhood. Still happening today. At Nuzi, we also found an interesting text that gives a, um, gives a parallel to this. It says this, If Galimnanu, the bride, will not bear children, Galimnanu shall take a woman of Lululand, <laughs> where the best brides were obtained. I don't know. I wanted a Lulu when I was looking for a wife, didn't you guys? <laughs> she will take a woman of Lulu land as wife for Shenema, the bridegroom. So you see, the same principle is a woman can't bear a child, so what does she do? do? She, she provides a surrogate in her place who will bear children, and they will actually become her children. The same, the same custom as we have reflected in, in the text in... Um, in Genesis. Here's another example. It's the Law Code of Hammurabi. All of you have heard of the Law Code of Hammurabi. Critical scholars said that, the law, that uh, Moses could not have written uh, the Ten Commandments in 1450 BC, which is a date I like for the Ten Commandments in Moses. He could not have written the Ten Commandments in 14 BC, for 1450 BC because there was no system of laws codified that early. Then archaeologists are digging at a place called Susa, and they find this large black monument, a black stela, which shows, which is inscribed with cuneiform script, and it shows Hammurabi, the king of the old Babylonian empire, receiving the law from his god, Shamash. And inscribed in the Babylonian script underneath this picture on top is 282 laws. It dates to 1765 BC. Well before the time period that the critical scholars said Moses could not have written the Ten Commandment law because there was no codified law. The fact is the law code of Hammurabi proved that Moses could have written the law that early and the critical scholars were simply wrong. Here's another example. It's called the Ebla tablets. In the Ebla tablets, they found, about, they found in a city in northern Syria at a place called Ebla, they found this huge treasure trove of thousands, 20,000 cuneiform tablets between 1974 and 1977. Critical scholars had said that Moses could not have written the books he's said to have written, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, because in those days of Moses, there was no alphabetic script. Again, I'm dating Moses to 1450 BC. Archaeologists were digging at Ebla, and they found that Ebla dating to a thousand years earlier than the time of Moses they found a script that was alphabetic. And the first two letters in the Ebalite alphabet were Aleph and Beit. And you know Hebrew? It was the first two letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So again, critical scholars were simply wrong. There was an alphabetic script that early. And it was shown to us by the law code of Hammurabi. The second way I want to show, show you how archaeology has helped us understand the Bible better is this. Archaeology has confirmed that people and places mentioned in the Bible actually 
existed. Back to Ebla for a second. When they were deciphering the tablets at Ebla, they came upon tablet 1860. And it reminded them of this text in Genesis chapter 14, 1 and 2. By the way, this text is a ton of fun to read. (laughs) My church members better hope that I don't choose this for a scripture reading one morning. At that time, Amraphel, king of Shinar, Arigok, king of Elisar, Ketelaomer, I think I should have named my son that. Ketelaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim, went to war against Birsha, king of, Bira, rather, king of Sodom, Birsha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemaber, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor. We have these five cities, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Bela, or Zor. Critical scholars said these are mythical cities. They didn't really exist. Then they find tablet 1860 at Ebla, and they find on tablet 1860 these five cities mentioned, not only mentioned in the exact same order as Genesis 14. I think that's fascinating. Evidently, there was a pecking order of those ancient cities. And so the cities were confirmed. The critical scholars were simply wrong And the Bible knew what it was talking about. Here's another person that was confirmed through the Bible, through archaeology, from the Bible through archaeology. The man Caiaphas, high priest at the time of Jesus. Matthew 26, 3, it says, Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. We know from... Josephus, who was an ancient historian, that Caiaphas' first name was Joseph. Archaeologists were digging around in Jerusalem, and they found a typical first century tomb. This is a picture of that tomb. It was full of what we call ossuaries. An ossuary is a, also called a bone box. They're boxes that were were created for secondary burial. You might not like this description, but forgive me. What happened was that they would take someone after they died and take them to the tomb and lay them out on the slab of the tomb. Their body would decay. It would dry up. Next time they needed the tomb, they came in and broke the ligaments on the bones and gathered the bones together and put them in these bone boxes. And so you have these family burial tombs and they're full of these ossuaries, probably used for several generations. And they found these ossuaries. Now, it's it's really quite fascinating. This is just such beautiful carving on this ossuary, isn't it? all carved to hold dead men's bones. Well, on one of the ossuaries, well, actually on two of the ossuaries, they had the name Caiaphas scratched into the side of the sarcophagus, into the side of the ossuary, I should say. But one of them is the actual, he says, not just Caiaphas, but actually has the first name Joseph Caiaphas. And so most archaeologists believe that this is the actual bones of the high priest at the time of Jesus. He's mentioned in no other sources other than Josephus and the Bible. And he's been confirmed now through archaeology, that he actually lived. Here's this uh, front page of Biblical Archaeology Review. Do all of you know Biblical Archaeology Review? It's a wonderful book. It's a wonderful magazine to get. I don't agree with 30% of what they say or 50% of what they say, but it's still fun to read. They, they declare that this is the tomb of Caiaphas, these bones in a limestone ossuary. Perhaps it's the very man that the Bible talks about, probably the very man. 
Another, another example of people that have been confirmed by the Bible may surprise you. King David. Most archaeologists and critical scholars have considered King David to be about as, as historical as King Arthur. In other words, not. Here's this text in uh, 2 Samuel. It says, when all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a compact with them at Hebron, Hebron before the Lord and they anointed David king over Israel. King David. It's, it's almost impossible for me to say David. It's always King David when I think about him from the Bible. But most archaeologists said, eh, there is no such person. Well, it wasn't about the early 1900s, early 1993, as a matter of fact, that an archaeologist is digging in the very tippy top of Israel at a place called Tel Dan. He knows it's Tel Dan because this was an inscription that talks about Tel Dan. So this is kind of like a, a identifier that this place is actually Dan of the biblical period. His name is Avraham Biran. Now he is, he is excavating and finds during his excavations in this large plaza, he finds a carved stone in secondary use in a, in a wall, built into a wall. When they pulled it out and began looking at it, <clears throat> it's covered with inscription. Unfortunately, it's incomplete. We don't, they haven't found the rest of the inscription. They've been looking, but they haven't found the rest of the inscription. And the inscription as it reads talks about a king who came down to Israel and Judah. Now, this is a, a Canaanite king or a pagan king who came down and attacked Israel and Judah. And these are the words. It says, he defeated the king of the house of David. It's not David he defeated. It's another unnamed king who is of the house of David. Now, this is quite fascinating because not only does this confirm the existence of David, but it also confirms that he had a ruling dynastic line. It's a very, very significant discovery. The king of the house of David. This, this uh, find was so significant that it made the front page of the New York Times and Time magazine. It's so significant that the biblical critical scholars actually accused Avraham Biran of forging the inscription and planning it. That's how earth shattering this inscription is. The king of the house of David. Now, right about this time, within the year of this time, they also discovered something in Egypt. A very well-respected archaeologist, Egyptologist, by the name of Kenneth Kitchen, was looking at a well-known inscription on the temple wall at Karnak. I've actually just seen this temple wall about a, two years ago when I was in Egypt. Uh, the ex, it, ex, it tells about the exploits of an Egyptian pharaoh whose name was Shishank the first. You all understand that we number them. You understand what I mean? We've numbered them. So when people came to see him, they didn't say, Hail Shishank, number one. Because nobody knew number two was coming, right? So we've numbered them. So this is the exploits of Shishank the first. And Kenneth Kitchen has, you, you can see down on the side here, you see all these little men's heads? Well, these are the 100 cities that Shishank claims to have conquered. And one of them, he interprets as reading the king from the heights of David. And so again, David has been confirmed from archaeological resources. Confirmed twice. Through the years, I've made it made it uh, my point to try to discover how many people that 
are in the Bible have been confirmed from archaeological or secular historical resources. And my list is at over 100, which shows that the Bible is full of history. It's simply full of history. The critical scholars are wrong. Okay, the third way I want to tell you about how archaeology has helped us confirm the Bible is that archaeology has helped illuminate dif difficult words and phrases in the biblical text. Here's a text. 1 Samuel 13, 19 through 21. It says, Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, Lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share, that's a plowshare, you understand, and his coulter, and his axe, and his mattock. Verse 21. Yet they had a file for the mattocks, and for the coulters, and for the forks, and for the axes, and to sharpen the goads. Now, frankly, the text doesn't make a lot of sense. The reason the text doesn't make a lot of sense is because in the Hebrew text, there's a word P-I-M, yod maim P-I-M. And frankly, the translators of the King James had no idea what the word meant. And so they said, well, they're talking about sharpening things, so maybe it's a file. And so they translated it. They translated it so they had a file for the mattocks. Archaeologists were digging at a place called Tel Lachish, which is in Israel. I've been there. It's a wonderful tell to visit. They found at Tel Lachish this small inscribed weight. And on the top of the weight is an inscription. And it says, Pe Yod Maim. P I M. What was Peem? Peem was a, was a weight, it was a measure of weight. And as a matter of fact, when they put it on a scale and they evaluated it against other known weights, they found out that a peam is a two-thirds of a shekel. And so modern translations translate this text differently. Verse number 21, we're just going to read. The Israelites are bringing down their stuff to be sharpened. Verse 21, the price was two-thirds of a shekel for sharpening plowshares and mattocks and a third of a shekel for sharpening forks and axes and for repointing goads. You see, just finding that little P-I-M on the top of a weight made this text understandable. It's a schedule of charges for the blacksmith to sharpen what the Israelites wanted sharpening. Archaeology helped us understand the meaning of that text. I've given you three ways tonight archaeology has helped us understand the Bible better. On Sunday night, I'll give you two more ways. The text now makes sense. Over and over and time again, the Bible stands the test of time. It stands the test of being accurate, the test of being authentic and reliable and trustworthy. Archaeology has helped confirm all of those things. When I was a child, my mom had a book that had this poem in it. I, I loved this poem as a child, long before I became interested in archaeology. And let me just quote it for you. It's called The Anvil of God's Word by a man named John Clifford. He writes this. Last night I paused beside a blacksmith's door and heard the anvil ring the vesper chime. Then looking in, I saw upon the floor old hammers worn with the beating years of time. How many anvils have you had, said I, to wear and batter all these hammers so? Just one, said he, and then with twinkling eye, the anvil wears them out, you know. And so I thought the anvil of God's word for ages skeptic blows have beat upon. Yet through the noise of falling, and yet though the noise of falling blows was heard, the anvil is unchanged, the hammer's gone. 
over and over again, God's word has been vindicated. The Bible has been vindicated. I can show you through archaeology how the Bible has been vindicated, but still I have another conviction I have to share with you. Because even though I can show, with you, show you on an external level that the Bible has been confirmed archaeologically, the Bible is not a book about archaeology. It's not a book about history. The Bible is a spiritual book. The Bible is meant to be read in a spiritual way. Archaeology can confirm the Bible, but it can't speak to us in a spiritual way. Here's an example I'll give you of that. A guy named Sennacherib. He's a Assyrian king around 800 BC. He comes to Israel, actually comes to Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah, and brags about encompassing Jerusalem and caging up the king, Hezekiah, like a bird in a cage. He does that on this large prism, which we've found, archaeologists have found in the ancient Assyrian cities. So we know from archaeological sources that Sennacherib came and surrounded Jerusalem and caged up Hezekiah. We know that. It's fact. The Bible tells us about it also. But Sennacherib doesn't tell us the rest of the story. The Bible does. Here's this text in 2 Chronicles 32, 20 through 22. It says, King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos, cried out in prayer to heaven about this. And the Lord sent an angel who annihilated all the fighting men and the leaders and the officers in the camp of the Assyrian king. So he withdrew to his own land in disgrace. Wonder why Sennacherib doesn't write that on his prism, right? You know, in the ancient world, Assyrian, Babylonian, Egyptian kings never lost a battle, at least according to their own records. Never lost a battle. And so what did Sennacherib do? He withdrew to his own land in disgrace, and we went into the temple of his God. Some of his sons cut him down with a sword. So the Lord saved Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and from the hand of others. He took, the, he took care of them on every side. You see, I can show you that, that from secular resources, from the prism, that Sennacherib was there, but only the Bible gives us the spiritual point of view. It tells us about the angel who came. The Bible is a book of faith. It never ceases to be anything but a book of faith. That's why, the, that's why we have this text in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It says, all scripture is God-breathed. King James Bible says it's inspired by God and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible, it says, the Bible's own testimony to itself is that it is the word of God. It's from God. And I have a conviction that we either accept the Bible as a book from God as a whole or we reject it as a musty old book as a whole. The Bible cannot both be the word of God and full of all the errors that critical scholars say it has. It cannot be both. And so I personally have cast my lot in and set my flag to be on the side of the Bible and to be believing that the Bible is inspired, the inspired word of God. Listen, if the Bible is the word of God, this is the question. If the Bible is the word of God, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to follow it or ignore it. The Bible contains the principles for living our lives still today. And so I think our purpose in life, what God wants us to do, is to study the Bible because I believe God has a plan for our lives and that that plan is revealed in the Bible. 
So this is my challenge to you. How is the Bible in your life? If I were to come to your house and look at your Bible, would I see it as a well-used book? Or would I need to pull my brush and my trowel out and do a little excavation on your Bible because the dust is so thick? Which is it in your life? How is the Bible in your life? Someone has estimated that only about one-tenth of one percent of all the ancient sites in Palestine has been excavated so far. About one-tenth of one percent. There's a guy whose name was um, Clarence Fisher who worked for the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. Anybody ever been to the Oriental Institute at Chicago? Ah, Wonderful museum. He worked for the Oriental Institute and he went to a place called Megiddo. This is Megiddo on the screen. He was going to excavate Megiddo from top to bottom in total. He was going to excavate all of this layer, all of this layer. He was going to go from top to bottom, the whole excavation. He dug between 1925 and 1939, 14 years. He spent one million dollars. Now that's when a million dollars was really a million dollars, right? One million dollars in 1925 to 1939 dollars. He excavated five percent of the tell. It's a massive undertaking, probably an impossibility. Only one-tenth of one percent of the ancient tells in the Middle East has been excavated. It makes me think that the greatest treasures are still to be found in the ground. And that's one of the reasons why I like to be there. There's that thrill. I'll have to admit it. There's the thrill of not knowing what the next shovel spade will turn up. It's just a little exciting. This, you wouldn't be surprised to know that this is one of my favorite texts, Matthew 13, 44. It says this. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all that he had and bought that field. I love this text. But I have to tell you, Not only do archaeologists find great treasure in the field, but in the Bible, there are great treasures to be found. Don't let anything stand in your way. Keep on digging. I'd just like to close this part of our session with prayer. Let's let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for giving us the Bible, for knowing that we'd we'd have need of something to depend on and for giving us these these confirmations via archaeology and other resources that show us that the Bible is is indeed accurate. So Lord, I pray for those who are here tonight that you would help them to grapple in, in their own lives of how they're treating their Bibles and that you would draw us so that we can draw closer to you through its study. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.